jealous and kind, sovereign and merciful. By his truth I can be upright, by his strength I do endure, by his power I can lift it, in his love I am secure. He bought me with a price, freed me from the pit, filled with emptiness and wrath, and a fire that burns within, I'm saved. You can do better than that for Jesus, amen.
so infant Oh, is his grace Emptied himself Of all the love And he bled For Adam's Endless race Amazing love How can it be That love of God Should die for me Amazing love How can it be That love of God Should die for me For such a long time Sin and nature's nights, but the light of God diffused a quickening ray. And when I woke up, my dungeon, oh, my dungeon flamed with light.
Worship the Lord. Play again, Benny. Come on, let's worship it. you're so good. You're so good. Ah, woo. Jesus. Jesus.
bless you, Lord. Bless your name, O Lord. No, 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 nobody like you. No, 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 nobody like you. No. Just for us, Jesus. Just for us, Jesus. Just for us, Jesus. lift our voice. We'll lift your voice and praise Him. Just one verse. I have found hope. It's closer than a mother. Jesus, it would break my heart. I would lose my life if 
Just a good teacher, he was more than just a good man. He died and rose again, his name is Jesus. He's not some false religion, he's the only way to the one true God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
got the show far here tonight. See here? Come on up here, brother. Before we're seated, we're going to just shout. And uh, you don't have to shout. If you don't want to shout, we'll shout for you. I don't know what it was like on the days when before, right before the walls of Jericho went down. I don't know if there's some folks that were scared to shout. I don't know if some folks are just ready to shout, but they shouted. How many need God just to do something in your life? I want... How many would say that that thing that you need Him to do, you can't do on your own? That's what the walls of Jericho was all about. They're not coming down, friend. Those were impossible to penetrate. And so the Lord told them to do something simple that they could do. All this is tonight, friend, is you're looking at that mountain, that wall, whatever it is in front of you, going, Jesus... You're the one. You are the one. Folks, I want you to shout tonight. We're going to lift this out. Where's he at? When he sounds his shofar, you shout in the overflow at the Family Life Center. You need to outdo us. Ready? Scott, come on back. We need to do one more. We're going to do this. We're, before we're seated, uh, Mike, we got some folks out evangelizing tonight. A couple hundred. We've got a couple hundred students out on the streets. Those of you, the Marines that are here, those of you that are from the military, you know the power of that. I mean, they're out. It's one-on-one -on -one evangelism, talking to people about Jesus. I don't know what I would have done if someone hadn't come to talk to me about Jesus. Chip, you got 10 copies of my book there. Where are those books going? Okay, this, this man, Chip Woolwine, a teacher in one of our schools, has taken these 10 uh, stone cold hearts to 10 boys that are in jail, incarcerated, you know, behind bars. 
You know, what, what would it be like, friend, if there weren't people that went out? You know what I'm saying? Taking the, and he brought them to me tonight. He said, Steve, would you sign each one of these to each one of these boys? And that's always enough course. You know that. I don't care how long. If you have a thousand, I'll sign them all, brother. Because that's these. And tonight, we've got a couple hundred students out there that are going to be one-on-one -on -one in your face. And there are, there are young people that are about to walk into a bar right now. And instead of getting in that bar, they're going to be confronted face-to-face -face with the gospel. God's going to set them free. Let me tell you something. It may not be your boy, it may not be your daughter, it may not be your husband or your, your, your wife, but it's somebody's daughter. It's somebody's son. Yeah. I just realized we got a worship team on the streets and street preaching tonight. All right, now. That'll work too. You get some of that worship going on, friend, people are drawn to that. As a matter of fact, it'd just be awesome to take this whole crowd onto the streets. Well, so what I want you to do, rather than shout, I just want you to lift up a prayer for everyone that's out there evangelizing tonight. When he sounds us so far, I want you to lift up a prayer. Just begin praying for the lost souls and pray that God would give those that are evangelizing. They got boldness, okay? But just pray that God gives them wisdom with their words, okay? Ready? God, you may be seated. Charlie, I need the ten most one. How many? This is your first week of revival. Would you live? Sovereign Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. He has sent you to the poor To bind up the brokenhearted To bring freedom to the captain Release the ones in darkness Yes, this is the year the favor of the Lord. Is upon us because he has anointed us. He has anointed us to preach oh, the spirit of the sovereign God is upon us because he has anointed us to preach. Instead of money, we will pray. 
is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Oh, yes, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. One more time, our God. He can do anything. Whatever you're going through, he's bigger than that. This is one of my favorite notes. Everyone stand. We're going to pray. Uh, this is one of my favorite notes of, of the revival. And we have just stacks of stuff. But um, this is a, um, someone utilizing the offering envelopes. There was not an offering in it, just a note on the front. And it said this. Ten months ago, Jesus used you to deliver me from ten years of drug addiction. You laid hands on me, and I, they're, they're saying me, but it could have been anyone on the prayer team. It doesn't really make any difference. God's moving. You laid hands on me, and as I went down, I had an encounter with Jesus. I saw him walking towards me. He placed his hands on my chest and pulled something out, which he released up into the sky. This took place at the Awake America in Pennsylvania. Until that moment, I had lost everything in my life. In fi fact, I had just come out of a coma induced by a drug overdose. But I have gained back everything in 10 months. Everything that the devil has taken away. I've gained back my health, my family, my car, a good job with a great prestigious information systems company. I've gained 60 pounds back, he said. I've been totally healed. I, I wanted to read that to you because in a few minutes we're going to be praying with you. And I want those of you in the Family Life Center, everyone here to listen. We don't pray with folks just to be praying with people. We pray because God is moving. He is touching lives. Some of you who are dry and thirsty, you're just dry and thirsty, and you haven't had a touch from God for years. Your hunger is drawing God. That draws God. But when we pray for you, something's going to happen. I don't know any other way to put it. Uh, I've been here too long. I've seen too much. And you need prayer tonight. Be prayed for. Can something happen if I don't get prayer? Of course it can, friend. God's big. But there's an, there's an anointing that's flowing. And uh, we want to pray with you. And so we've got a huge prayer team tonight. All the pastoral staff. I'll be out there wandering around praying for folks. Uh, pastor will be here. We'll all be here praying with you. But be prayed for tonight no matter what you're going through. If you're sick in body, we want to pray for you. And uh, I want everyone to sit down and stick, except Brother Corbin. Everyone sit down, and Brother Corbin, you remain standing. This brother right here, how many of you think you might be able to spot him tonight? <laughs> it's that low-tone coat you got on, brother. E.T. Corbin is 87. 87. He's ministered throughout West Florida and the peninsula, just Florida, all his life. Planted churches, held evangelistic crusades. He's been with this revival from the very beginning. As soon as it broke out, he came over and just fell in love with it. I mean, he said, this is God. You know, God's moving. This is what I've seen all my life. Uh, this is one of the old timers that's been around. How many appreciate the folks that have been around? And... Uh, He's got a special touch on him for healing. God uses him in healings. 
And if you'd like special prayer tonight, all of us will be praying for healing. Any, any, any one of us can pray for you. But if you're anywhere in his vicinity, have him lay hands on you and pray for you. Now, there might be a bunch of people around him, but he'll stick around and pray for you. He came to the last Awake America, and uh, I announced that. And um, I think we just about killed him. Because, <laughs> you know, the Awake Americas, we've had up to 16, 17,000 people at those things. You, you announce, you know, that man wants to pray for you. <laughs> he, had, he must have had 1,000 people all gathered around him for prayer. And then at the end, they had to pray for him. Just... <laughs> Did we pray? We're going to pray right now. Everyone stand. <laughs> We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Bienvenidos a los que son de Venezuela. Bienvenidos hermanos. Que Dios les bendiga. We welcome everyone de Mexico, de Peru, de cualquier país que hablen español. El idioma del cielo. I said we welcome everyone who speaks Spanish, the language of heaven. <laughs> But we're going to pray right now and ask God to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. No matter who you are, you need changing. It includes me. There's more to what we have. There's more to it, friend. Peter, when I read the story of Peter's shadow healing the sick, I get so jealous. I get so jealous. I don't know if when you walk down the road, people flop, and, you know, flop down in front of you for your shadow to fall on them. But um, I would like for that to happen. I'd like to see that happen. I would like you to be the vessel that God would use you. There's more. And so we're going to say, we're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. I see some of you going after God right now. There's such an intensity in this place and in the Family Life Center. Those of you at home, we welcome you. Those of you that are watching by, by a computer, you're in, you pulled up the website, we welcome you by radio and by television. You've pulled up the right site. We want you to stay with it all the way through the program, stay with it all the way through the television program, all the way through the radio program, and let God speak to you. Everyone pray right now. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. Tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., Mike Brown will be speaking on confronting Goliath. How many have heard Mike Brown speak? He's good, friend. He is good. Mike and I became friends before the revival broke out through our um, mutual friend, Leonard Ravenhill. And um, when he came down here just to visit, we just, just have a kindred spirit. And uh, he's, God spoke to his heart about this school, and you see that it's just a, it was something that was in our hearts also, but we needed someone to do it. And uh, Mike is a man, without a doubt, but he's got an anointed message tomorrow at 11 o'clock. It's open for everybody. And if you're thinking about going to the mall, you can go to the mall, but a mall is a mall is a mall, friend. Okay? You won't hear teaching like this at the mall, okay? Confronting Goliath. And if your Goliath is spending money at the mall, you need to come here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, this morning I got up with an overwhelming sense in my spirit that something powerful was about to happen. And I know some of you may look at me and you go, how can you just keep going like that? You know, just because I want to tell you, friend, we have tapped into a source that is, he's limitless. And it's not like God gets tired. You know, he's just always ready and he's always anxious and always going. He's always looking for somebody. He's always looking for somebody that says, let's go, God. Let's go. He's looking for somebody that'll take him at his word. And this morning I just felt something, friend. Did you know you can feel God? This, yesterday, Mike and I were, Mike Brown and I had to do, uh, had to make a business trip and, and uh, we went to an old bookstore. And um, that's part of the business trips always, friend. We always go to old bookstores. And, and we made it to this old bookstore, and, and we found a journal of, um, an old journal of uh, Charles Finney. And it was an unusual journal because I got five of his journals, but this is a journal that I had not seen before. 
and it had stuff in there, chaplain, that eats you alive, man. Where, where Finney talks about the power flowing through him. And it just in his journal, he wrote about the, uh, and now I've got a journal where he talks about the waves of electricity shooting through his body. But this, this talking about uh, just waves, uh, other, this was a different time where the power of God was just shooting through him, coming on him, and he felt the presence of God. And many people don't like to read stuff like that because they don't, you know, they don't like emotionalism. Friend, I love to sense the presence of God. I love that. I love hugs from my family. I love kisses from my wife, and I like feeling the presence of God. There's nothing wrong with that. And as I read that, I thought, well, that's the secret to Finney. I mean, if you had, and he wrote it in two paragraphs, what the power did that day in his life. And as he, you read that, no wonder he got out in the plazas of this country and in the factories and the schoolhouses and shook them up because the power came down. Say the power came down. Hmm. Something powerful is about to happen, not something devastating or tragic, but something powerfully good. Something positive. Something extraordinary that's out of the ordinary. Supernatural. Say supernatural. That means beyond the natural. I love stuff like that, friend. Beyond the natural. I had a Baptist pastor come up to me just a couple of weeks ago, and he um, gave me this bear hug. And, he, and we were planning this Awake America, and he gave me this bear hug. And he goes, you don't understand, Steve. My whole life has been changed. My whole church has been changed. And he said, my son has been saved. I mean, what he was talking was beyond the natural. It was all supernatural, and we both lit up like light bulbs. And then a Lutheran pastor came up to me, and he goes, we're behind you, Brother Steve. And he had that same glimmer and that gleam. And you could tell the supernatural. Something had happened to him and his church also. How many believe in the supernatural? Well, I made my way to my study early this morning, and the Spirit of the Lord came over me. Tonight's message is going to relate to every man, woman, and child. Everyone here tonight. How many are here tonight? Now, I've preached a lot of different messages here at this revival since Father's Day of 95. From Genesis to Revelation, I've preached on just about every subject, given an altar call at each one, always presented the gospel that Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life. And we see hundreds of thousands of people come forward. And I never get tired of it, friend. I met a man the other day that told me he was in the ministry and told me he was bored. If you're bored and you're in the ministry, go build cabinets. Go wash cars. Go sell cars. Go mow yards. Get out of the ministry. I don't know how boring a ministry could be boring. You want to unbore yourself? Go out to the streets and talk to people about Jesus. That's not boring. <laughs> that'll, that'll wake up any dead man. I mean, you get out there and walk up to somebody cold turkey and say, I don't know you and you don't know me, but Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. That'll unbore you in a heartbeat. That'll give you something to do. We are living in days right now of darkness, disappointment, and despair. Every day you wake up, there seems to be some breaking news, some gloom and doom stories that's enveloping either a person or a country. I can't believe what our president goes through constantly. I mean, pray for Bill Clinton, okay? It's old sins coming up on him, but man, it's just constant, one blow after another. It's enough to kill a man. As a matter of fact, right now, we're going to pray for him. We're going to pray for him right now. I want you to pray with me out loud. Dear Jesus, we lift up the President of the United States of America, Bill Clinton. We pray for Bill, pray for Hillary, we pray for Chelsea. We pray, God, that you would touch them, minister to them, meet their need, and God, 
we pray that as their hearts are right, you would bless them. Bless them with your presence. And God, give them the wisdom to run this nation in your precious name. We bless them. Amen. That felt good. But a lot of stuff is always going on. Something's always happening. If you pulled up the headlines today, you'd hear the CIA talking about the international problem with Y2K. Pretty much the problem here. Folks are not talking that much about it, but overseas, they're scared. Wall Street finds no relief was a headline. Superbugs found in chicken feed. That means, um, how many have not heard that? Raise your hand. Oh, don't eat chicken. <laughs> They're finding virus, super, the viruses in the chicken feed. And of course, what the chickens eat goes into their system. And that virus goes all the way to the local, that Kentucky place. And um, anyway, they're trying to solve this chicken feed problem. Death rate from diabetes is up in the U.S. You just get up in the morning and read this stuff, friend, like good morning, okay? You know, you're, you're having a chicken burrito for breakfast, and it says, <laughs> superbugs found in chicken feed. Death rate, and you have diabetes, and it says death rate from diabetes up in the U.S. And then you're thinking about surgery, and the, another headline says, surgery may raise brain disease risk. This, these are the headlines today. Then deadly European avalanches. And then prisons are breeding racists. This is not good news. Okay? How many would bear witness to that? And those of you from Venezuela, Peru, anywhere you're from, the same, it's the same old. I've lived in other areas of the world, and you pick up the paper, and it's just trash. It's just stuff that the nations are going through, people are going through. Rarely do you hear a good story. I'm in contact with the New York Times concerning a story that I want them to run about a young man who came down there who was a racist. He was part of the KKK. And he came to this revival. He was a cross-burning, card-toting KKK member. Mean as a snake. His dad was a part of the KKK. He's a part of the KKK. He comes to this revival on the second night, walks down from over here, gives his heart to Jesus, and he is totally transformed. It's a phenomenal. It's un, the, the guy's in his, like his early 50s. It, it, it's a phenomenal story of how God's delivered him from racism. And we've got a video of him and some black brothers just loving on one another. It's just, it's just phenomenal. And America would love to read stuff like that. Something good, but we don't get much of it, friend. We read stuff like this. I, this is a website, I don't know if you've seen this, and we're gonna turn to the scriptures in just a second, but this is, this is from the, uh, the, the government, the National Council for Alcohol and Drug Abuse, it, and it talks about, you can pull this up on your web, your, your computer every day, and as you pull it up, the numbers are changing as fast as you look at it. And I had Tommy, my secretary today, to stop the computer at 5.32 p.m., 29 seconds after 5.32 p.m., and this is what it said. Today, that means in about 17 hours that this day has been upon us from 5 o'clock earlier, 4,500 people started smoking marijuana for the first time. 8,300 people started drinking for the first time. 244 people began using heroin for the first time. 1,067 people started using crack cocaine and cocaine for the first time. 1,826 people started taking hallucinogens. I want you to look this way, friend. 1,800 young people started getting high on acid in 17 hours today. Now, you can multiply that every single day. That's probably about 2,500 people a day starting to take acid for the first time. These things scare me. If you've ever been on LSD, you know the danger of it. How many have done drugs before? Lift up your hand. You think about... 1,800 kids taking acid for the first time, and probably half of them are on our highways right now. Hallucinating. 
Not even seeing your car, seeing, seeing colors and lines and all kinds of hallucinations instead of your automobile that's coming at them. 1,333 sniffing glue for the first time and 6,017 people are smoking cigarettes for the first time. That's all bad news. There's a lot of bad news, but tonight we're not going to talk bad news. Hallelujah. I heard that. We got good news. Friend, I am pumped. I'm just, something's happening tonight. This message is entitled, I see something you don't see. I see something you don't see. For those of you that are in despair, those of you that are going through hard times, those of you that are at the rock bottom of your life, those of you that can't seem to see the light of day, I see something you don't see. Those of you at home that are hoping somehow your marriage will come back together, those of you on alcohol and drugs that you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, like the folks in the baptismal pool tonight, they were so sick and tired of drugs, they were so sick and tired of alcoholism, they were so sick and tired of Satanism. I see something you don't see, and I want you to stick around. Before the end of the night, you're going to see it too. Well, we're going to turn to a couple of scriptures. Psalm 43, 5 says this. 43, 5. I'll give you 18 seconds to find it. 17, 16, 15. Old Testament Bible school students. Psalm 43, 5. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. Six five four three two one. Psalm forty three five says this: Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. Say that with me. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now I'm going to read some other scriptures. I'm not going to give you 15 seconds to find them. Psalm 146:5 says this: Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope say hope, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Proverbs 10:28 says this: The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. Let's say that together. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, blessed is a man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Now, if you want a scripture to look up when you get home on despair and hope, read Lamentations chapter 3. It is phenomenal. I'm not going to read it to you tonight. I've got it all in front of me, but it is incredible. The whole chapter. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5 says this, For the hope, say hope, which is laid up for you in heaven, where you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, verse 23, says if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope, say hope, Hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, made a minister. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our. Oh, you didn't get it. I'm going to read it again. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is is our hope. We're going to talk about that for a minute. I see something you don't see. Hope is a desire with expectation of fulfillment. Now, those of you that are waiting for a judgment message tonight, you're going to waste your time. I'm not preaching judgment tonight. I'm preaching hope. Hope is a desire with expectation of fulfillment. That means when you hope for something, you have an expectation that it's going to come to pass. Are you listening? It's to long for something with expectation. It's to trust. It is to rely upon. It's not just thinking something might happen. When you hope, the blessed hope of his soon return. When I say the blessed hope of his return, you want to know what that is? Jesus is coming back. I don't know when, but he's coming back. And I'm going to be ready when he comes. It means to expect. It means to anticipate. It means to foreknow. It's the opposite of hopeless. 
hopelessness, having expectation of good, uh, no, having no expectation of good, incapable of solution. This is a hopeless situation. I don't know what we're going to do here. This is horrible. How many have been in situations like that? Be honest. Been in rough situations, difficult situations, flat tires out in the middle of the desert at midnight, just stuff, no spare, hopeless situations. When we were in Teen Challenge, constantly, it was, we lived with hope. You know, we had no toilet paper. We had to hope God would bring toilet paper. We would, we would have, we would have time. We would, I don't know what you pray about, friend. We'd pray about the simple things in life, like toilet paper. Maybe you got money for it. We didn't have no money for it. And there was times, and we were brand new in Jesus, all these ex-drug addicts, you know, brand new. And we would be without toilet paper. And I think to this day that the director could have gone out and bought some. Okay? But he's trying to grow us up in the Lord, you know. And, and he'd, he'd come to us and he'd say, uh, gentlemen, you know, <laughs> look at the closet. There's one roll left. There's three bathrooms. This is tough. Eleven guys, you do the math. <laughs> this is not going to work. He said, you better start praying. Friend, when I started praying for toilet paper, I was serious. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? I'm not praying with doubt. I'm praying, God, this is a necessity. This has got to happen. One time, and Jim Summers, the director, he, he'll remember this. He comes to this revival all the time. One time we were praying, a bunch of us, and we were so new in God. That, you know, God just blesses brand new converts, you know, like, like little kids. He just blesses us. And we prayed, and we we're praying for toilet paper, just screaming out for toilet paper. A guy, a, <laughs> what are you screaming out for? <laughs> oh, God, we didn't care what it was either. Charmin, it didn't matter. We didn't care if it was that brand next that had little wood chips in it. <laughs> we just, <laughs> we just wanted toilet paper. <laughs> and we would be praying. And one time, and this is this happened, one time we were praying, and a guy was doing reading his Bible just a few blocks down from the ministry, this young man, and he knew who we were. He knew that we had a big sign out front, Teen Challenge, and he knew who we were. But he was reading his Bible, and the Lord spoke to him and said, the boys down the road need some paper. So he went over to his... <laughs> He went over it. Well, I needed stuff like this, friend. We really needed stuff like this, but I needed my faith to be encouraged. We prayed, and God was looking at us. He was seeing the sincerity of us. And so he gets a roll of toilet paper. He goes running down the highway. He comes up to the house. He knocks on the door, and he says, God spoke to me. <laughs> well, I was reading my Bible, and here... Well, you don't know what that does, friend. You, if you can believe God for toilet paper, you can believe God for anything. <laughs> How many know that's the truth? He comes through on little things. You can believe him for mountains. I mean, a toilet paper, if he'll, he'll do that, he'll do anything. But despair is the loss of hope or confidence to give up or to lose heart or to lose courage. Now, let me explain a little bit about I see something you don't see. You're dealing with somebody here tonight that believes not only in miracles, but I believe in personal contact with the miracle worker himself. I have seen God come on the scene too many times. See, that'll spoil you. It's like my kids know me. I have a three-year-old, I've got a seven-year-old, and I've got an 11-year-old. Before the revival, Ryan comes up to me with his rollerblades and something's wrong with the rollerblades. He doesn't come to me thinking that I might get around to it. He knows me. He said, Dad, my rollerblades are broken. And so I take them, take them straight to the little workshop and fix his rollerblades. Then he comes in, they're all, the wheels are spinning like lightning now, and he goes into my little daughter, Shelby. She sees his rollerblades and the wheels spinning like crazy. So she comes out to me. She says, this is what the evangelist does before the revival meeting, by the way. She comes up and he says, my daddy, my rollerblades. And somehow there was cat hair all caught up inside those things. That <laughs> but anyway, they, my kids will tell you, oh yeah, dad, he's a personal dad. My dad is not a distant dad. 
My dad, in the busiest of times, he'll hug me. He'll bring, I can bring my rollerblades to him. He'll stop. He'll take all the wheels out of them. He'll fix them. Why? My dad's a personal dad. Well, my God is a personal God, friend. He's personal. He's not somewhere off. And some of you have a God like that. You need to get back home tonight and realize that God is not out in outer space. He's right here with us. He's near. But I've seen him come on the scene. When there was so much darkness, I've seen him come in bright light. He's come in my darkness. When all the doors were shut, I've seen God come in and kick open a door. Some of you need that tonight. I've seen miracles, friend. Just stuff that you have to you have to behold it with your eyes to see it. Many of you from Venezuela, you know what I'm talking about. You work in foreign soil. When you go working in other areas of the world, you've got to believe God. Because there ain't no money. There's no, you can't go around trusting all the riches because there's no riches. And so you see miracles take place. You see God move. That's why so many people are healed in foreign countries. They're desperate. They don't have 16 doctors to go to before they finally get desperate. Well, if I could go back to the Bible, let me, let me explain something. Don't turn to these scriptures because I'm, I'm not going to give you scriptures. I'm going to give you stories. Let me explain to you. I see something you don't see. There's all kinds of stories in the Bible where people didn't know something was, gonna about to ha was about to happen. They were in a trial. They were going through a hard time. But see, now I've read the Word. I know the story. But let's go back for a few minutes and see some of these people that are going through. If I could go up to Job, who had lost everything he had, I see something he didn't see. I could go up to Job and say, Job, hang on. God is going to restore everything and more. If I went up to the three Hebrew children who are about to be thrown into the fiery furnace, I could go up to them and say, without a shadow of a doubt, God is going to deliver you. I've read the book to Daniel in the lion's den. Those beastly critters, Daniel, are going to get locked jaw to the children of Israel facing the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit. I'd walk up to them and say, hey guys, I've read the book. God is going to roll back the waters and make a way for you. Are you hearing me tonight, friend? I see something they didn't see. I've read the book. I'm talking to them, and these can be translated today. Some of you are going through major problems. These people were going through major problems and received a major deliverance. Oh, if someone had come up to them in the middle of them and said, do you know what's about to happen? You've got to hear this. I've got a revelation from God to Sarah in her ripe old age. God is going to give you a baby boy to blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10. Jesus is coming by and he's going to stop and he's going to pop open your eyes. To the widow woman who had lost her only son. Someone's coming to your funeral procession who will mess up everything, lady. He's going to bring your boy back to life. Is anybody listening? To the weeping family of the members of Lazarus, I could walk up to him and say, Hey, ladies, don't weep. Don't despair. Here comes the resurrection and the life. <laughs> to the marauding maniac man of the Gadarenes. You're not going to be bound by a legion of demons. You're going to be found by a chain snapping, devil defeating, hell gate crashing, demon rebuking, life giving, death defying son of God. I see something you don't see. My first point tonight is this. For those of you within the sound of my voice, and how many are within the sound of my voice? But those of you that are here that are bound by sinful lifestyles, you find yourself consumed with fleshly lusts and addictions. It seems these sinful ways have total control. Let me tell you something, sir, ma'am, look this way. If you can't go to a Walmart and walk by the checkout counter without your eyeballs falling on those ladies on the magazine covers, you're in sin. That's sin. If every time you look around and there's some half-naked person trying to pull you away and you are pulled away, you've got a serious problem. Because a man of God or a woman of God could turn easily, just like that. 
But if you're finding yourself wanting, when you're clicking through the channels and something flashes across that screen, screen and you have to click back to see the rest of it, you're in bondage. I said you're in bondage. It's quiet in here. It's getting weird. People are getting quiet. They're looking at me like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about sin. That's not sin. Would Jesus do that? Could you see Jesus at Walmart looking at the Cosmo cover? See Jesus in your home with the, the clicker going click, click, click. Oh, I don't think so, friend. He might be watching some guy wrestle alligators down in Australia, but he ain't going to be watching <laughs> that other junk. How many have seen that show? That man's a trip. When we do the crusade in Australia, I want to meet him. And I'm going to tell him face to face, you got to touch God on your life. I don't know what you believe in. But you got you to touch a God. And he'll go, he'll be like this, and this, this gator will be 72,000 pounds, you know, and just jaws in front of him. He'll go, now don't try this at home. <laughs> These are very, he could snap my head off in a second. Be careful now. <laughs> but if sin has you under control, friend, you need help tonight. You try to obtain, you try to abstain from drinking, perhaps. You quit for a day or two, then go right back to the same old thing. Perhaps tonight, cigarettes control you. Chewing tobacco has a hold on you. Alcohol, pot, pills, crack has a hold on you. They have you pinned to the mat. Sexual lust seems to have permeated every waking thought of yours, and you're tired. You're tired of sin having such a dominant role in your life. You're ashamed at how you, a grown man or a woman, can be driven by such animalistic behavior. And it's animalistic, friend. But once you get saved, once you get saved, and you go out and see a group of people, how people act, it's animalistic, friend. Once you get saved, truly saved, and you go to the mall, and you watch guys that are not saved slobbering over girls and panting and look just like a bunch of dogs, just like a bunch of animals, you realize how far gone you were before, friend, how pitiful you look in the eye. God created you in his image, and you're acting like a dog. You're acting like a wild animal. Well, I've got good news for you, friend. If you're in sin, if you're in bondage, my God is able to deliver you. He's able to set you free. I see something you don't see. I see total deliverance. I can see God setting you free tonight. It can be crack cocaine. It can be alcoholism, friend. It can be pornography. He can set you free, but you got to let him do it tonight. God can deliver you. How many believe that? Oh, friend, I'm a testimony to that. I know he can. The Bible's here's what you got. He can give you a brand new start. I'm talking hope here tonight, friend. That's what this Brownsville revival is all about. See, three and a half million people don't come through a church because they like the preaching and singing. Three and a half million people come through here, friend, because God's touching them. Period. You can't, you can't, the line outside tonight. How many were in line? People don't stand in line to hear some music and hear some preaching. They stand in line because God's moving. Because God is moving. Tonight, I'm telling you, God is moving, but you got to move towards him. The Bible says in Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I love that. How bad are you? Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. This is Bible. Psalm 40 said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings, friend. He will do it for you tonight. I see something you don't see. I'm going to move on, but I want this to come across to you, friend. you got to understand. 
We had a young kid, I think he was from Houston, came up one night here. And he's, he was, his eyes were sunken down. But he had this look on his face of desperation. And uh, I don't know, is Charlie, is he stepped out for a minute? Charlie, remember him. This kid, he rolled up his sleeve. And he had track marks all up and down his sleeve. Just all up and down his arm. Just, just if you haven't seen track marks. How many have seen track marks? Just needle holes. All the way up. And he looked at me. He held out his arm. He wasn't ashamed. He was just, he was dead, basically. He didn't care who saw him. He just pulled his arm. He goes, preacher, can God help me with this? And I looked at that boy, and I said, I want you to do something. And I pulled out my arm, and I said, I want you to rub right there. And he took his finger, and he started rubbing my arm. And there's a knot there the size of a marble that'll never go away. And he knew exactly what it was. And I said, that's morphine. I shot straight through the vein and it coagulated, it's hard as rock. And I said, I was just like you. And I said, if God can do it for me. And I was saying to him, I've seen something that you haven't seen. I see deliverance. I know he can do it in your life. If he's done it in my life, he can do it in your life. I can feel tonight, friend, hope rising. Those of you at home, there's hope in Jesus. He is our hope. There's no hope in religion. Religion will damn you. There's no hope in just study. Study is fine, but friend, until you get in touch with the living God. I know people who study the Word, but don't know the God of the Word. I know people that go to Sunday school, but don't know the God of Sunday school. I know people that preach the Bible, but don't know the God of the Bible. you got to know Him tonight, friend. He is your hope. Psalm 103, if you're sick in body, if you're in sin, the Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all, say all, all, all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. What a scripture. For those of you that are in sin, in just a few minutes, God's going to deliver you. He's going to set you free. Those of you in the Family Life Center, I'm coming to you. I've seen something you haven't seen. I can see it. He's going to do it in your life. My second point. For those of you tonight that are dabbling with demons, you've been dancing with the devil, you've opened yourself up to the evil influence of the powers of darkness, I've got good news for you. There is a name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We've had witches come to this revival and sit in the back row and chant with their little rattles. You know, you know, whatever a witch's chant would be on that night. And they'd be sitting in the back. And we welcome any witches, any warlocks, anyone who comes, we welcome everybody. You're wasting your time. At chanting, you're in the right place, but you're wasting your time trying to chant against the preacher. It's just a waste of time. Why? Got news for you. The one you're serving, the devil and the demons of hell, know the God of this revival. They know who he is. They know his power. They know who he is. They know his power. They know who he is. They know his power. They know greater is he. 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 Friend, if you don't believe this kind of preaching, there's something wrong. Because this is Bible. This is Bible. That's all it is, is Bible. There's a scripture in the Word. I love this scripture. I talked to you about the Gadarenes just a few minutes ago, about the man of the Gadarenes. You know what the demons said to Jesus? They said, Jesus, thou son of God, have you come here to torment us before our time? Think about that, friend. That's the position of a devil. That is the position of a devil. Jesus, we know we're doomed. 
We know we're doomed. And have you come, have you come to annihilate us before our set time? They know it's over. They've seen the book. They know it's over, friend. Oh, man. Those of you that are demon-possessed, those of you at home that have been messing with Ouija boards, Dungeons and Dragons, every other wild internet game that's out there, and you've, con you've confused yourself, your mind is full of demonic activity, I've got good news. The devils believe and tremble. James 2.19 Jesus came, 1 John 3, 8, to destroy the works of the devil. So I got news for you tonight. The devil's going to flee. By the way, I preached one night in this, mess, in this revival. Um, that's just the way it is. And I preached one night, that's just the way it is, just to the devil. The whole message was to the devil. That's just the way it is. Just sort of facts, you know. That's just the way it is. And Satan, I just want to say one more thing before we move on to point three. I want to read a scripture to you, Satan, okay? The Word. Revelation, oh, you know this. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night. Folks, I've seen some stuff in this revival. We've cast out demons. How many have been involved in a demon uh, possession deliverance type of case? They're awesome. I mean, it's awesome. Because the devil, first of all, you're, if you're ever into casting out devils, you have to do that. Just keep in mind, you are nothing. God is everything. So that's, you know. He lives in you. Jesus lives in you. So it doesn't matter if they foam, they kick, they scream, they holler, they cuss, they go, I know you. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of stuff, you know. Change her. Just stand there and look at them like, you don't have to stand back and go, what does that mean? You're, you're. <laughs> Let them have their little spill and then look at them and go, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I bind you. We've done it plenty of times, and we'll do it plenty more times. Anyway, we got to move on. Number three, for those of you that have messed up and have a despicable past, I see something you don't see. Those of you that have messed up and you have a despicable past, horrible background, I see something you don't see. I see total restoration. Now, if you're here tonight and you haven't gotten saved yet, get a load of this, friend. You're not only going to get right with God, but he's going to restore you. He not only forgives. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Joel 2.25 says this, And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the great army that was sent upon you. Friend, I'm here to testify to you. He will restore the years. Did you not hear the note that I read earlier? How many heard that? I don't know what happened to it. It's somewhere. Did you not hear this? Ten-year crack addict. By the way, this man, his testimony is validated, been, has been validated. It's a true, bona fide, powerful deliverance. But he said, I've gained back everything, including my health, my family, my car, a great job, 
Friend, if you would get right with God and stick with Jesus and stick with him. I'm not talking about playing games. I'm talking about sticking with him. He'll restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Where's my mama? You here, ba mama? I call her baby. <laughs> mama, stand up. I love you, mama. There's the woman right there that has more knowledge of me than just about anybody else. She lived through hell with me. And when I talk about God will restore everything, my mom's sitting out there going, my God, he has. Mama, I don't know if I ever showed this to you, but this is a, remember when I was arrested the last time for the narcotic sales? She remembers every single drug deal, the, drugs, uh, the drug arrests. She was there. But I lost all my rights as a citizen of the United States of America because I was a felon. I was arrested for hard narcotic sales. And you lose all your rights. And in a way, you know, when it happened, it didn't really bother me. But later on, it bothered you because I, I was right with God. And I'm a citizen, you know, and I was a good citizen. I, I was a taxpayer. And, and I'll never forget when this came in the mail, and it says, it having been, ha been made to appear to the Alabama State Board of Pardons and Paroles that Stephen Hill number 75-12-870F was convicted in Madison County on February 9th, 1976 of possession and sale of Delata. Tells about my sentencing, and then it says this. It further appeared to the board from the, for the official report of the probation and parole supervisor, which is a part of the record in this case, and with no further information to the contrary, that the above name Stephen Hill has so conducted himself since release as to demonstrate his reformation and to merit restoration of all his civil and political rights. And, and, and in compliance, in compliance with the authority vested in the State Bar Board of Pardons and Paroles by the Constitution and the laws of the State of Alabama to restore civil and political rights, it is ordered, not suggested, it is ordered that the loss of all his civil and political rights resulting from the above stated conviction and any prior disqualifying convictions be and they are hereby restored. He will restore the years that the locust has eaten. I'm telling you, friend, he'll fix it. If you'll let him, he will fix it. I'm going to close in just a minute. Number four, for those of you praying for lost loved ones. How many are praying for lost loved ones? prodigal, you know, her out dancing with the devil. I see something you don't see. Hope in God. Hope. I see something you don't see. Charlie, I want you to have an usher bring that old barrel up to me. Just, or you bring it up, Charlie, that aquarium. Charity's going to come in just a minute. She's going to sing mercy seat. We're going to pray together. This thing right here, they probably dumped a lot of the pictures out. It's usually full of the top. But this thing right here, just drop it down a little bit. Don't drop it, though. I'm just going to grab as many as I can. This right here probably re represents two to three hundred desperate people. Moms, dads praying for lost loved ones. The notes on these pictures will blow your mind. The notes, the, the, the stories, you can take it back. People put, people put names and addresses and telephone numbers and pictures. And they'll put a handkerchief, they'll put an earring, they'll put a pencil on that prayer table out of desperation. And I've had them crying as we're over there praying, Brother Corbin. They'll be crying as we're praying. And I've had ladies grab my hand as I'm laying hands on a picture. Pastor, this has happened to you too. They'll grab it and they'll jerk your hand up and slide her picture underneath your hand. They'll 
Friend, you don't know what that feels like, man. And you look around, you see a mama, and you look at that picture, and it's a picture of a drug addict's son. And friend, mama, I see something you don't see. I see your prodigal coming home. See, I know my Bible. I was talking to my mom the other day, and she told me the story about a Lutheran minister that came up to her. I'm closing in just a second. That came up to her right before I got saved. And I was in the worst condition. I'd been kicked out of school. My mom had to come and get me when I was kicked out of school. By the way, any stories you read to the contrary, ask my mama. There's a lightning rod right there. But my mom picked me up when I was kicked out of school for drugs. And it was just, it kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. How many know sometimes when you pray, things get worse? It's all God at work, friend. God's working. But a Lutheran pastor came up to her and said this, and I didn't know about this pastor. My mom, no one was hanging with her for her son. She was a Lutheran woman believing God for the salvation of her boy. And many people had given up. Am I telling the truth, Mom? Many people had given up. And they looked at me as a hopeless case. But a pastor, a Lutheran pastor, came up to her and said this, Anne, you have raised four children. One of them has gone astray. But he'll be back. You know what he was saying to you, mama? He was looking at you in the eyes and saying, I see something you don't see. That's what he was saying because he was seeing in the spirit realm. She was seeing the drugs, the alcoholism, the crimes, the jail. That's all she saw, and it was constant. He comes from the light of Christ. He steps into her life, and he says, you've raised four kids. One of them has gone astray, but honey, I just want to tell you something. God's going to save your family. God's going to save your family. He's going to be saved. One of the reasons we have such a great time now, my sister was here last Friday night. My brother comes to revival, my younger sister. My whole family saved. And it wasn't like that a few years ago, friend. Trust me. It was way opposite to that. But I read some scriptures, and I'm closing. Jesus said unto him, this is Zacchaeus, this day is salvation come to your house. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost to the jailer's household in Acts 16. I love this. And they brought them and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Say, and thy house. Let me tell you something about that scripture, friend. They weren't at his house. They were at a jail where an earthquake had taken place. I want you to understand that. This was, this was, they weren't at the house. I'm saying to you, you might be here. You might be around where the miracle work and the power of God's going on. But I'm telling you right now, God's going to get a hold of your family. We have people in Bible school that some parent, somebody put their picture in that tank over there. And now they're in the Bible school. But they weren't, friend, a few months ago. A year ago, two years ago, they were as unsaved as a prodigal son. There's another one. Well, stand with me. Charity, come join me, sis. I see something you don't see. Those of you that are dry and thirsty, I want everyone looking this way, everyone in the Family Life Center. You're dry and thirsty? The Bible says, I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I see something you don't see. I see something you don't see. I've got so much hope and belief. See, I believe God can bring revival to America. You may not believe that. I believe that. Those of you that are dry, I can see God just touch you tonight, and you're going to leave out of here so infatuated with Jesus. Those of you that are lukewarm, God's going to touch you tonight. 
You're going to be so on fire when you leave out of here. And it's going to be natural. You know, it's not going to be an unnatural thing. You're going to feel so good about how on fire you are. It's going to be a normal thing. And you're going to love being in love with Jesus. That girl's story tonight broke my heart, how she is living in two worlds. Remember that little young lady story? That's a phenomenal. That is America in a nutshell. They know the right, right way to go. They're going another way, and they're miserable. You may be like that tonight. I see something you don't see. You may not see a way out, but I see a way out for you, friend. God's going to set you free. Everyone with the chairs, move them to the left and the right. We've come to the, my favorite part of the revival service. I'm going to give an altar call. Matter of fact, everyone look at the folks moving the chairs just to get it out of your system. Just look at them. All right. I remember one night at the revival, this guy right in this area here was just going. And I looked at him and I thought, this guy is hard, hard up for entertainment. I'm telling you. This, if this is the biggest thing that's happened in his life. <laughs> Just never seen people move chairs like that before. They're quiet too. See how they move them quietly? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you set that up, brother. Boy, you go bragging on somebody and they just turn on you. Here's what we're going to do tonight. Those of you that are away from God, I want everyone looking this way. Those of you that are away from God, we're going to give you the chance to get right. Now, sin is the root problem of everything I just got finished talking about. That's the root problem. Sin is why Jesus died on Calvary. He didn't die to give you a new house. He didn't die to make you happy. He died to take away your sin. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. I want everyone to say that. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. If you want to define it through Scripture, you can look through there and say, yeah, it's violating God's law. It's transgressing God's law. It separates you from God. But I want to tell you, a modern day definition, because you, you saw the fad, WWJD, many people are still wearing those bracelets. Why was that so faddish? Because people know what Jesus would do. A heathen out there knows what Jesus would and wouldn't do. And so sin is anything he wouldn't do. See that screen right there? The videos at your house, every video at your home, should be able to be played on that screen on Sunday morning in front of the church congregation. I'm talking about I should be able to walk into your house and randomly pick any video. Just with my eyes closed. Pick one and not even look at it and walk in and just put it in the deck and let it play on Sunday morning with your name underneath it. Why? Because there's no sin in your house. There's nothing you're ashamed of. There's nothing that you wouldn't want other people to see. Why? You're not watching anything that Jesus wouldn't watch. This is heavy duty stuff, friend. But some of you are playing games. You've got a Jesus at church, which at church you're really pious, you really look right. But at home, it's more relaxed, more, you know. You know who's watching that? The devil. He sees that. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Righteous man. The Bible also says without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And so that's unholy what you're doing. So you expect your prayers to be answered? I don't think so. But the Bible says sin separates you from God. It's like a brass heaven when you sin. So we're going to do something tonight about that sin. Everyone that's listening through earphones from other nations, I want you to hear me. Because some of you may have come 5,000 miles to get here. I want to make sure you come the last 50 feet. If you need to get right with God, don't just stand there and say, well, I went to the Brownsville Revival if there's sin in your life. 
Everyone in this room that's backslidden, everyone in the Family Life Center that's black backslidden, you're doing things that Jesus would never do. You were once on fire for God, but now you've drifted away. I'm going to give you the opportunity to get right with God. Little things don't bother you anymore. You've grown cold. You've grown cool. I can spot a backslider just like that. When we go around, we can't go anywhere in these tri-state area without people running up to us that know us from television or this revival. And you can tell people, some people run right up to you and they're just glowing. Other people will look at you and go, oh man, just the other day did this. He goes, hey pastor. I said, how you doing? He goes, all right. And you can just tell, backslid. Just backslid. Away from God, you can just tell it. Still had respect for the minister, but backslidden. You can tell a backslider they've cooled off. They'd rather go fishing than go to a prayer meeting. They can spend five hours playing a, a, a game of golf, but they can't spend 20 minutes reading the Word. That's backslidden. Period. There's no other way to look at it, friend. Quit being so kind to yourself. Examine yourself. Take a look, a look at yourself and, and say, am I like this? Do I do, I, do I want, do I do these things rather than God things? Backslider, you're going to get right with God. I've got hope for you. God's going to forgive your backslidings. Those of you that have never known the Lord, you're going to come to this place quickly, this altar. That means you've never met Jesus. In the Family Life Center, those of you at home, you've never met Jesus. You don't know him. I'm here to tell you. He's the Savior of my soul, and He wants to be your Savior. When I die, things get better. I tell my kids all the time, when I get on a plane or something like that, I tell them, I said, I've told my kids many times, it doesn't make any difference if I see you graduate from high school. I want you to graduate, but I'd much rather get raptured. And if I die, I'm going to go to be with Jesus to die is gain. To die is gain. And sinner, those of you that are away from God, there's nothing like living for Jesus Christ. He's your peace. He's your hope. There's, it's awesome to wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart. It's awesome to be able to pray and see miracles, to see God move. It's awesome to wake up in the morning and know what you did the night before. That's awesome. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? That is cool. It's awesome to have a clear conscience. That is neat. It's awesome to have peace. It's awesome. Those of you that don't know the Lord in a minute, you're going to meet him. Those of you that are religious, religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting on the cross. There's a big difference. You can go to hell like this young man said tonight. You can go to hell with baptismal waters dripping off your face. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. I'm warning you, friend, you can go to hell with a promise keeper's shirt, shirt on. You can go to hell and be the head of the women's meetings. You can go to hell and be the evangelist of the Brownsville Revival if you don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people out there, friend, that are preaching. They don't know God. They're master preachers, but they don't know God. And on that day, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, in your name I cast out devils. In your name I prophesied. In your name I did mighty works. It doesn't say he tried to do those things. He said he did them. Jesus is speaking. They did those things. See, that's where the smoke screen is. You do all these things, and, the, and you're just so tickled to death, and you think God's blessing you. No, friend, the devil's out there. He's going, just keep it up, but just don't do it under his lordship. Don't do it under the lordship of Jesus. Just do it on your own. Because when he says, depart from me, I never knew you, that has to do with the lordship of Christ. You did everything on your own. We were never fellowshippers. We were never friends. You go your way, I'm going mine. Hasta la vista. I'm warning you, friend. Religion will damn you. But I'm a faithful church attender. I am too, friend. So are my kids. But it won't take them to heaven. 
I pay my tithes. Good for me. It won't take me to heaven. You got to know him. And I'm going to take it one step further before Charity sings. Young people, I want you to hear me. Are you infatuated with him? See, you're supposed to be the bride. He's the groom. Anyone who says they're a Christian and they're not living like what I'm talking about, I question their salvation, period. And if you have a problem with that, what you need to do is go in a closet somewhere and shut the door and say all the things that I've been saying to God. Say, God, Steve said that I'm supposed to be infatuated with your son. Steve said I'm not supposed to be watching movies at home that I couldn't show at church. Say this to God. Just talk to him. Don't argue with me. Say, Steve said that I can go to hell with baptismal waters on my face. Steve said that I can do all kinds of great works and, and go to hell. And I think God's going to say, well, it's Scripture. It's Scripture. If you're ashamed of my son, he's ashamed of you. If you're lukewarm, he'll spew you from his mouth. If you're cold, you're not going to make it. Argue with God about it, friend. We're redefining Christianity in this revival, friend. A Christian is someone who is on fire for God, adheres to Jesus, his teaching. And for those of you that don't know the Lord, for those of you that are religious but you don't know him, you're going to come in just a minute, you're going to get on fire. That means you're anticipating his return. You love him. You want him. You know him. Wave at me, Jerry. It's my wife, Jerry. We love each other. We've been married 20 years. Honey, do we have sweet fellowship together? Do we go out on dates all the time? Do we love our dates? We are, and she's not like this. She's smiling because we have some of the best dates in the world, friend. We have a great time. We love being with each other. But could you imagine if I was talking about my relationship with Jerry and all, and she was standing out there going, what date? Think about it, friend. Some of us are just like that with Jesus. We say, oh, I love him. Oh, I love him. Oh, I love him. He's sitting out in the congregation going, what? She hasn't talked to me in a year. Every time she wants something, she's screaming in my ears. But she doesn't read my word. She doesn't fellowship with me. She doesn't talk to me. That's religion, friend. Get right with God tonight. Relationship is what it's all about. Get in right relationship with Jesus Christ. You're going to repent. And keep in mind, the only thing that's going to keep you back tonight is pride. Pride will damn your soul. Pride will say, I don't need to go down to that altar. Everything's just fine. I don't need to go down there. I can go back to the Days Inn. I can go back to the Hampton Inn. I can go back to the Holiday Inn. I don't need to do this right here. Friend, that's pride. The Bible says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's the way it works. So if you want forgiveness, you're going to come to this altar as soon as charity begins to sing. And keep in mind, the one who shed all pride was Jesus Christ. He's the one that was beaten. He's the one that was whipped. He was the one that was spat upon. He was the one that was mocked. He was the one that was cursed. He was the one that was blindfolded and slapped. He's the one that was laid over and beaten. His back was ripped open by a whip, plowed like a plower plows a field. He's the one that went all the way to Calvary. He's the one that was pierced. His hand his legs he went all the way to Calvary stripped and hung on the cross for you friend the least you can do is come down to this altar if you need forgiveness the least you can do is that for him he is your hope he is your only hope this is not a judgment message friend this is hope this is hope Everyone who needs forgiveness, Charity is going to sing Mercy Seat. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord, you're here tonight and you're backslidden, you're here tonight and you need forgiveness, as soon as Charity begins to sing, I want you to come quickly. Right now. Hurry. Hurry. If you need forgiveness, come on right now. Hurry. Hurry. And kneel at the altar. Kneel at the altar. Come on. Right now. Hurry. Hurry. Kneel at the altar. Come on. Come on. Hurry. In the Family Life Center, let's go. I face the power of sin on my own kneel at the altar i did not know kneel at the altar of a place kneel at the altar. i could go come on come on where i could find come on. a way to come on. heal my wounded soul come on kneel kneel at the altar come on come on he said that i could come, come to his presence come on Some 
something you don't see. I see hope. I believe God is going to heal your marriage. I believe God is going to set you free. I believe God is going to deliver you from drugs and alcohol. I believe God is going to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And ma'am, sir, I believe God's going to save your family. Right now, get on your knees in front of that TV set and ask God to wash you clean. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to cleanse you. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. He'll do it for you. Come on. Jesus is your only hope. Come on. Hurry. 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 God bless you, sir. Come on. Lost in the curse of a lifetime of sin. Come on. Come on. Come on. They never come, come on. True. Come on. But I know where there's a place of mercy come on. for you. Come on. He come on. Said that you can come into come on. his presence. Yes. 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 I see something you don't see. I'm a running I see forgiveness, friend. I see forgiveness. He'll wash you. I'm a running to the mercy seat. He'll wash you, friend. He'll wash you. He'll wash you. He'll wash you. Oh, the blood, oh, the blood of Jesus. He'll wash you. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. No one move. Everyone at the altar in the Family Life Center, stay right there at the altar. I want Linda to lead us a couple times through this one chorus, Lord have mercy, and then we're going to pray together. I'm going to give you just a few more seconds to come. Friend, if you don't come, you're going to regret it. We've had people leave the revival and call us later wishing they had come to the altar. Don't do that. Come to the altar and get it over with right now. Get it taken care of right now. Get the blood washing your sins away right now. Be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And then when you leave out of this place and someone says, what happened to you? You can say to them, well, I see something you don't see. Jesus Christ, I didn't have a clue what was going to happen to me. But he washed my sins away. He cleansed me. Folks, if you're coming, matter of fact, we're going to do something. I want everyone in this place to do something. Those of you at the altar, stay where you're at. But everybody else... If you're here tonight and you're away from God, please respond with, to what I'm talking about tonight. I want to have everyone turn to the person next to them and you're going to ask them this question. Do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? Don't do it yet. And when you turn to that person, someone turns to you, please, friend, don't lie. Not in this place. This is holy ground. Remember, three and a half million people have been through this place. Hundreds of thousands have come to the altar. Don't lie. Don't lie. Be one of those that's bold enough to say, yeah, man, there's sin in my life. I need forgiveness. And then both of you come down together. 
There's room. I mean, we've had them go all the way back to the end of the church, all the way down the aisles. You got to step out, though, friend. God bless you, sir. You got to step out. When you step out, the chains snap. When you step, when you step out, the chains snap. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you can sense the difference. Everyone, turn to the person next to them. Ask them if they need forgiveness, and then both of you step out together. Come on. Lord, have mercy. Come on. you for the hundreds that responded just then. Every one of us, we're going to pray at the altar. Everyone at the altar, if you're here and you're serious at the altar, I want you to pray with me. Jesus. If you're not serious, you're wasting your time. Jesus. But I believe everyone at this altar is serious. Jesus. I want you to pray out loud with me, everyone at the altar right now. In the family life and those of you at home, pray out loud with me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, Jesus, for not leaving me alone. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this place. Tonight, Jesus, I have hope. I have expectation that you are going to do what your word says. You said, if I will confess my sin, you will forgive. And I ask you to forgive me. I have sinned. Wash me, cleanse me, make me white as snow. I repent. I'm sorry. I ask you tonight to be my Savior, be my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. Jesus, come live your life through me. In your precious name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory. Yes, Lord.